We are going to, um, how is the evening going to go? We are going to, um, I'm going to very briefly describe the thesis of the book um, in three or four minutes. Uh, I'll try and keep three or four minutes. And then uh, we have a, a very interesting group of people up here who will uh, tell you what they agree with and disagree about the book. Um, uh, let to very briefly introduce them. Uh, most of them don't need introduction. Jonathan Friedland, probably the, the most celebrated liberal commentator in the country. Jenny Russell um, possibly competes for that title. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, I was thinking. <laughs> um, Guardian Times. Munira Mirza, who, gosh, what do you do, Munira? You used to be deputy uh, mayor of London. Uh, in the in the Boris days, uh, what are you doing? And I worked here at Policy oh, Exchange for did. a period yeah, of time. Yeah, you worked here at Policy Exchange. And Tim, who is a, one of the leading conservative commentators in the country, um, and might not be the most celebrated conservative. Mm. Right? <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, okay, you can do He set the bar right, so right. high. <laughs> yeah. so yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, I um, I just want to uh, to. Um, say something before I give an overview of the book, which is to, is to thank Policy Exchange, both for putting on this event and also um, for giving me a perch here for a couple of the last year or so and allowing me time to write the book. Um, Dean Godson, who is standing there overseeing events at the back, um, he thinks that I'm his tame man of the left Unfortunately, no one has told him, no one else in the country seems to think I am a man of the left any longer. Um, but nonetheless, um, he runs a very broad church here, and we are, amongst other things, looking at the, the shifts in politics from, from the old paradigms of left and right to, um, to the new, more socio-cultural paradigms, which is partly what my book is all about. Um, about the greater importance of, uh, of the issues that one might, might call the security and identity issues, which is why um, this, this, this value, uh, these two competing value blocks, or these two distinct value blocks that I, um, that I have um, labeled as the people from anywhere and the people from somewhere, and the, the book is partly about, um, why that has become, why these differences have become so much more important in our politics now than, than a generation or two ago. Um, so uh, briefly, I mean, the, I talk about the people from anywhere. I mean, it's sort of partly self-explanatory. It's sort of a, a colorful couplet, but you can see where I'm coming from. The people from anywhere tend to be um, well-educated, mobile. They place a high value on autonomy, on openness, fluidity. They are somewhat wary of, uh, of, of group identities of various kinds. People from somewhere tend to be much more rooted, um, less well-educated on the whole, more communitarian in their instincts, instincts, do place a very high value on different kinds of, of group identities, value, security, and familiarity a, a lot more. Um, I, um, uh, another way of looking at this is the, the rather the famous American sociologist who wrote these great sort of chemistry book-like tomes and functionalist sociology, Talcott Parsons, did come up with this one very useful distinction between achieved and ascribed identities. Achieved identities being those of successful people, on people who have passed exams when young, have achieved educationally and professionally, and therefore have a sense of themselves uh, that derives from their own achievement um, and, and is therefore a sort of portable identity that can fit in more easily in places. Whereas ascribed identities, as the word suggests, tend to be the things that people are ascribed with simply as through the form of human being they are, um, you know, to do with gender and ethnicity and, and place. The, the, your, your identity is much more fixed and for that reason is much more easily discomforted by change. Um, so you're much more likely to feel change as loss than somewhere, someone who has an achieved identity. Now, um, I have invented these labels, um, but what I haven't done is, is invented the, uh, the value blocks out there. I mean, I, I did a fair amount of um, plowing my way through the British Social Attitude surveys um, and, and indeed other kinds of opinion and, and value surveys, and these uh, these 
these groups really do exist. You might want to stick different labels on them. Uh, the numbers are obviously a bit fuzzy when it comes to something like values. But very broadly speaking, I would say that uh, somewheres represent about half of the population, anywheres between 20 and 25% of the population. There's a, a big group. Uh, obviously, anywhere and somewhere is, is very simplistic and binary. And obviously, there are huge, um, uh, huge variations within both groups. Uh, and there, there are, there are, there's at the more extreme end of the, uh, uh, of the anywhere group, there are people I call the global villages. At the more extreme end of the uh, somewhere group are, are genuine xenophobes and bigots, perhaps 5 7% of the population uh, on some subjects. Um, so um, there, there are, there are, these are real things. Um, as I say, I've invented only the, only the labels. Um, why is why have why have these issues become more why have these value divergences become more important now? I think it's partly because of numbers. I mean, if you, if you go back thirty or forty years, British common sense was essentially somewhere common sense, um, and then over the last twenty twenty five years, um, that has changed. Uh, it has changed completely, and um, this small small group, relatively small group, who completely dominate our politics, our culture, our economy. Uh, the, so many of the, of the whichever party has been in power, so many of the policies uh, that, that, have, that, have, that have dominated the policy agenda have been essentially anywhere policies, whether it's the, the huge expansion of higher education uh, relative to the, you know, and the, other, the, 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 the relatively, the relative poverty of the other post school options that, you know, the, the shrinkage of uh, technical and vocational education, at least until recently, and there is now some awareness that we've gone too far in this direction. This derives precisely from the fact that anywhere has all gone to Russell Group Universities, their children go to Russell Group Universities, this is the world they know and uh, have thrived in. Um, a knowledge economy, which uh, again, is built around highly skilled and highly educated people with a, with a kind of hourglass labor market. Um, with many of the, the, the somewheres who used to enjoy those middling jobs um, now squeezed out. Uh, we've, had, um, we've had mass immigration, a very open economy, um, globalization, anywheres have thrived, others have not uh, so thrived. So where we've, we've had a family policy, which I think in many respects has been more concerned with the, the promotion of equality for professional women than looking at the dire state of the working class family. Um, in so many areas, we've had what one might call uh, sort of anywhere liberal overshoot. Um, and this has created great instability in our politics. And uh, with one, of the, the, one of the most visible signs of that was the Brexit vote. If the, diver if the, the divergence between these two groups becomes too great, then you get an unstable politics, and that is, uh, that is unfortunately what's happened. Um, anyways, uh, I mean, I, 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 I don't want to sound too gloomy, and in the final chapter of the book, I talk about uh, you know, what are the grounds for a new settlement between these two groups. I mean, I think it is substantially a matter of anywheres recognizing um, that they have been too dominant and that their, their, their political preferences have not t taken sufficient account of the interests of somewheres. Um, and so quite a lot of what the new settlement is is, uh, is, is anywheres acknowledging that and, and allowing somewheres a greater, greater weight in the system. Um, I mean, I have some more specific ideas too we can perhaps talk about. Um, the, um, I mean, I think the, 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 uh, there is a really interesting argument. I mean, I think that the task of politics for the next um, generation, really, is to try and, um, is to try and sort of broker some sort of compromise between these two groups. And I think you're, you're already starting to see the argument within, the, within anywhere liberalism, between those in America and here, between those liberals who are saying, my God, you know, Trump, Brexit, whatever might come down the line next, we have really screwed up. Um, we have alienated you know, large chunks of our population, and we better do something about it. We better listen to these people. We better ad adapt, adjust. And then there's another group who are doubling down, who are saying, this is an absolute disaster. They are the barbarians. We are the civilized people. We must not budge an inch. Uh, and it is the outcome, I think, of, of, of that argument between those two strands of, of liberal uh, that the stability of our politics actually depends over the next few years. Anyway, I think I've probably um, spoke for rather more than three or four minutes. Um, 
So um, let me hand over now. Uh, everyone here will speak for five or six, six or seven minutes. Um, I will then claim a, claim a right of reply at the end. <coughs> um, uh, but um, let, let's just go in this order, shall we? John, can you go first? And then no, 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 leading Tory commentator. No. We then me. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we decided this behind your back. Uh, oh, okay. Jonathan is going first. No democracy. Yeah. No. Um, I was just going to tell people at the back there's four at least. You can sit anywhere, obviously, yeah, yeah. tonight. You don't have to sit somewhere, but, the, uh, but there are here. four seats here. <laughs> um, um, so, I, well, I was just going to begin by applauding uh, David. Congratulations on this uh, book, which I think is obviously extremely timely. I think in the way you just formulated these two categories of liberal, uh, in rather perhaps typical Guardian style, I want to sort of split the difference and, and, and bridge both to say, obviously, I'm in the camp that feels chastened by recent events the last year. I think you'd have to be uh, just cloth-eared not to think something's got to change uh, and that Liberals have to change. They clearly have, we clearly have failed in the two biggest tests in the United States with Trump and in uh, with the Brexit vote in Britain. So obviously I'm in that category. On the other hand, when you said about those who are doubling down that insist they're right, I mean, in terms of just liberal values and democratic norms, and I think this is sharper in the United States, I would absolutely double down on the rule of law uh, and on a free press, uh, uh, for example, if I was in debating in that context. There's no reason for liberals to feel they should be in retreat on those core, almost foundational principles. Uh, so I applaud the book. Uh, I think the U Anywhere Somewhere is a tremendously useful and clarifying frame and it it's, has great sort of purchase uh, in the book. I think also you do something extremely well, which is there is some choice data in there. You've obviously mined through, uh, as you said, surveys and data. And I, there were things in there I didn't know, which in a way are arresting to me. I had no idea, for example, that UKIP outpolled Labour by two to one in London among white voters in the 2014 European elections, which is a number that you have in that book. And that in itself just confounds so many, you know, uh, shibboleths that somebody like me would hold on to about London, for example, uh, in which, uh, you know, as a Londoner, I felt UKIP had made few inroads here and they didn't make much inroads because largely ethnic minority Londoners voted them, you know, again, voted them down. I think it may be UKIP and the Tories together. I'd looked at it just yeah. before, oh, right. but that's how you quoted it. Maybe, oh, okay. but right. Worth looking at, because yeah. to me it was a shocking number. Yeah. Uh, but what you wrote in there is that you UKIP uh, outpolled Labour two to one among white voters in London, but we'll, we'll check it. Um, so where, where do I describe? I'm sort of three areas that I was going to focus on. The first is I think the book slightly uh, casts anywheres as uh, rootless uh, and ungrounded in a way that I think is unfair. I think too often your depiction of anywhere slides into your depiction of this other group, which you name as global villagers, who are the sort of outliers, the hardcore 5%. And I think sometimes you allied from one to the other. And that's significant because I think that's the mistake Theresa May made in that very powerful sentence in her conference speech when she said, as if addressing such people, if you're citizens of everywhere, you're citizens of nowhere. And, you know, besides feeling personally slighted, uh, by that remark, I think it was saying something quite big because it made the mistake of thinking that those people who want connections that are uh, broad and global, who feel uh, connections with you know, others who are not like themselves, somehow that there's a zero sum quality to that, that in feeling that openness, it means you cannot be connected more locally. If you're global, you can't be local. And I just don't recognize that because my sense of the, you know, my fellow anyways would be, uh, that, and I'm going to come on to give you a specific example, but that they would feel, yes, they would like uh, Britain to be open and, uh, and embracing of newcomers, but that doesn't mean they are somehow less connected to this place. And you refer, and I, I was glad you did, to Danny Boyle's opening ceremony, in which I think you wrote you know, for the Olympic Games in 2012, and you rightly say that was a rare moment when anywhere and somewhere straddled. But I would say a lot of anywheres identified with that because it was actually avowedly British and it was avowedly rooted but it was saying that we are the sum of, you know, a, a, a history which has meant people coming in from all over the world. That's partly what it means to be rooted in Britain. Uh, it's not an either or. So I, um, I think you go down that Theresa May route. And the specific example I was going to give, partly in the 
spirit of self-parody, but I was going to talk you know, <laughs> in a classic Guardian way about the, my own neighbourhood, which is Stoke Newington in London, where else? Um, <laughs> you know, we, we, we weren't just big for Remain, we were big for Yes to AV. Um, <laughs> you know, it's probably most of the people who watched, you know, the killing in Danish <laughs> were in my postcode. Um, so it's easily caricatured, but I think about that area and, you know, through family ties, there are rural areas I've come to know almost as well. And oddly, as I was reading the book, I was thinking that on your checklist of somewhereness, Stone Newington would meet many of those tests. So on Halloween, for example, uh, you know, all the kids in the area are knocking on all the other kids' doors and all, everybody opens their doors and gives each other sweets and everything. It's a weird American custom. But it meant it was a sense of a local area. And in rural areas I've been to, there is absolutely not that. There would be a sense of, well, who are you? And um, why are you knocking House on my door? Houses too far apart. Uh, Houses too far <laughs> apart. Very practical. But similarly, for the, Queen's, true farmer. for the Queen's 90th birthday, street party in Stoke Newington, very well attended, uh, on that day. I don't know whether that would fit the stereotype in the most, and you know, recently this would fit, this would seem again in any way a caricature, but you know, Stoke Newington has its own book festival, which is immensely locally attended. It just, it's all, and it is very much about being in that area. And I just think your, your broad brush depiction of anywhere wouldn't allow for a culture of street parties, and uh, they would think that only happens out there in somewhere land wouldn't happen anywhere. That's the first point. I'm, I, I'm aware of time. So I'll gallop through the second. The second one is this notion that somewheres have been somehow unrepresented and lacking in voice in public decision making in, in recent times. And, you, and you, know, you give us examples. And I look at the new Labour period and then uh, the co coalition, and certainly Theresa May's government now. And I think of the way that Tony Blair always would speak for Sedgefield and Trimden working men's club, which was always in his mind when, for example, he introduced ASBOs, which would absolutely be a somewhere sort of policy, I would have thought. Or in that period where David Blunkett and then Jack Straw, remember talking about bogus asylum seekers. Uh, you've had George Osborne talking about skivers and strivers, that defined you know, economic policy or social policy and rhetoric, certainly in that period. You think of criminal justice all the way back to Michael Howard and prison works, a brief hiatus with Ken Clark. But really, there's continuity from the Tory through Labour through coalition. If anything, the most liberal period would have been perhaps the coalition, but would be absolutely somewhere ist in its approach to criminal justice. Um, on migration and the decision to uh, open the doors in a, in a way that was without transitional arrangements, you're absolutely right. Uh, and we can talk about that. But I think more generally, it doesn't feel like that anywhere led a country to me. It feels as if the prevailing uh, my mindset has often been somewhere, and there you have to mention, I think you mentioned it so little, but the role of the press, which absolutely is voicing somewhere views every day of the week and making views, the anywhere views of The Guardian, as I've just been parodying, quite a minority view in the British press. Uh, you know, the Mail and the Sun and the Express, etc., are just f full of nothing else uh, every day. Uh, and then lastly, I was going to say that some of the things you, on this point, and then one more thing and then I'm finished, on the anywhere victories you mention, uh, those often strike me in reality as being somewhere victories. So the changing shape of the family, for example, moving away from the two-parent family, uh, that would be something where in some ways policy was keep catching up with changes that were happening on the ground, including among the very kind of families you would describe as somewhere families, where single-parent households were becoming more and more the norm, not just in sort of elite Stoke Newington, but in Doncaster and in Hull and all over the country. So uh, I thought that the sort of framing of it might not be complete right. The third and last thing I wanted to say, though, is a large point about minorities. Um, and in the book, you depict minorities, if not as a threat, then certainly as a challenge to somewhere values, to cope with this influx of different minorities, ethnic and others, uh, and to cope with uh, uh, the changing impact they have on, on the country. And yet, I think, I look at ethnic minorities, and I speak as a member of a white ethnic minority, as, as a member of Britain's Jewish community, and I see absolutely somewhere characteristics through them. And I think in, in one point, you list how you define uh, the somewhere characteristics. And I think well, you could be talking about my community or any other, which is, you say, decent pol populists uh, want to have two-parent families who take responsibility for young children and e elderly parents, 
check. They, they want to live in stable places, high level of trust, check, low level of crime, some degree of neighborliness. They want responsible businesses that train local people, that's perhaps different. Friendly to individual immigrants, but place the interests of fellow members of the local national club before outsiders. It seems to me you could be describing the solidarity you experience in an ethnic minority or an ethnic community. Uh, and it seems to me that the fragmentation you lament and the impact, the change, the flux, that has been caused for so many of Britain some ways has not been caused by ethnic minorities. It's not the presence of a tight-knit Asian community that has made these lives so different. Rather, if anything, it's some of what those ethnic minorities have held on to in terms of community that many of Britain some ways, white some ways, would need a bit of. And so therefore, to finish, I would say yes to, and this is, I've had a journey on this right through since the 7-7 bombings and before, in fact, before, because of uh, something I wrote earlier than that. But that we do, multiculturalism does need rethinking to emphasis much more the ties that bind us together. But that process is usually depicted as essentially saying to ethnic minorities, no, you can't be separate anymore, you need to be a bit more like us. Well, I would say that has to become a two-way street, that actually Britain's minorities have a huge amount to teach the, uh, the white majority, who in some ways have lost the knack of community and solidarity and fellow feeling, which for odd reasons, Britain's ethnic and religious minorities have maintained. And so therefore, I would say this is a learning process both ways, rather than the white majority sort of pushing back at ethnic min minorities who somehow threaten them. Thank you. Um, what, I mean, I'll reply to some of that later, but I mean, just yeah. on your last point, I think you, you, you must have skim read parts of the book because you, the point I make is exactly the same point that you made. I say, actually, that contrary to, to, to sort of popular belief, uh, most, most of Britain's ethnic minority population are overwhelmingly somewhere in their instance. Mm. Uh, indeed, they're a kind of a sort of um, Trojan horse. I mean, you know, yeah. anywhere, is they're, they're, they're here partly because of anywhere openness, um, um, but actually once here are overwhelmingly in terms of, um, in terms of the, the, the values and the, and the practices you described uh, on the side of the somewhere is not you, the any, not the anyway. I've got to reply to that, but I've, I've talked yeah. for long. Yeah. So um, shall we have Tim next? No, so we, no, we won't. Together. We will not have Tim next. Okay, uh, we won't. Uh, this is my ready. party, right. uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we'll have you next. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, well, I too would like to congratulate David on this book because I think he's been um, brave over the past few years in being one of the first people That's on true. the left to challenge the assumptions that th the left held on to as complete gods at that point. And he got into a lot of, lot of trouble for it by saying that a country that is going to have a lot of immigration cannot also hope to have a strong welfare state without bumping into a lot of anger from the people within the country who then think we've got a free rider problem and why should we have a state which is very generous to everybody but is equally generous to newcomers who've not paid in as to those who've been here for a long time. And he was absolutely castigated for it at the time and um, he's had a lot of unfair labels pinned to him and I think it's really brave of him to have gone on pursuing doggedly this you know, intellectual true. Yeah. journey. Thank you very much. Um, I find myself reading this book thinking I'm in anywhere and under, under somewhere. Um, because I come from a family where almost everybody um, that I am related to has married somebody from another country. So in that sense, I'm accustomed to thinking that people have links all over the world and ought to be able to live in other countries if they want to. On the other hand, partly because I grew up as the daughter of an anthropologist and spent quite a long time in Africa, as well as rural Norfolk, as well as London, um, I'm just conscious that everywhere, all over the world, people hate the arrival of those people in large numbers who are not like them. Whether I was living in the southern Sudan and the Acholi in northern Uganda were fleeing Amin across the border to join the Acholi in southern Sudan, and my God, did the Acholi in southern Sudan hate the Acholi from Uganda, or living in Botswana when Zimbabweans were fleeing the then civil war in Rhodesia. Huge fury about that. Last week I was in, last month I was in South Africa in a remote village in the Cape where the local coloured population, Cape coloured that is, not black, um, are in a state of absolute fury about some Zimbabweans who have arrived who are basically the Poles of England, but in the Southern Cape, and they are being detested for their work ethic, their education, their willingness to take unpopular jobs at low pay, um, the fact that they're outdoing the local population in every way, and if the colours could run them out of town, my God, they would. So 
I have a lot of sympathy to the human need to hang on to what is familiar and known and to the fact that you cannot just ride roughshod over people and say, this thing that's happening, it's good for other people, if not for you, just learn to live with it. Um, and just before the last election, I wrote an essay for Demos as part of what should Labour learn from this um, debacle, which said, the trouble is that the elite people like us living in London don't understand the importance to people who don't have all the um, affirmation that we do from our status and our jobs and our ordinary lives of the local post office and the doctor that you know and the people that you know and the local pub and all the little things that make life worth living. So I, I came to this book with a sense of great um, excitement and I do think that David has identified many real problems. Where I would like him to go further, which I think is the million dollar question with this, is what the hell do we do now? Mm. And one of the things that is strikes me as very pressing is that only this week I was reading a book which I have to review so I can't tell you very much about it, but it's by a British Muslim and basically so far it is a cry of fury about the way in which Britain has not adapted to the needs of Muslims over the past 20 years. And one of the particularly contentious issues that she cites, which has left Muslims feeling very alienated from Britain, was the Salman Rushdie affair. And the perspective here is that Britain should have taken more seriously the offence that Muslims felt. And the perspective is basically that Muslims would have liked the British government to denounce Rushdie in some way. Well, there I think we come to one of the very deep dividing lines. This is Saeed Abbasi's book. It's Saeed book. Yeah. Okay, you're, you're getting a preview of the book. I mean, there are many interesting things she tells, but this, the, this is one of the, the, the points of great tension, mm. which seems to me we have a problem with, because there is no way of accommodating that perspective and saying to Muslims, yes, we understand this is blasphemous, we are going to side with you and agree with your anger about this, without also challenging one of the deeply held fundamental beliefs in British society, which is that you can write and say these sorts of things. And now that we've ended up in this position where we have agreed that immigration has been too fast and that we have got to do much more by integrating both sides, what do we do about the fact that we have a large group in Britain who, the somewheres, would say we must go no further in accommodating those sorts of values? and many of the other conservative Muslim values as well about the role of women, about whether girls in hijabs can dance publicly in the streets and so on. And the fact that they think that they are being discriminated against and they're living in our society, they think they're not being treated equally and they want more concessions from the majority. It seems to me to go to the heart of the problems in the future. So I'd love you, love you to address that. The other point is that I think you've got some fascinating ideas at the end of the book about what we could do to make somewheres feel less alienated. And amongst the, these things are either fairly radical or rather expensive, <laughs> which seemed to me an interesting combination. Um, David suggests, for instance, that priority should be given in public sector employment to citizens, and only to citizens. Public sector assets, above all public housing, should be reserved for citizens or those who've lived in the country for at least five years. I think that might be slightly less contentious. Um, public procurement should support local companies and employment. And then you suggest that all apprenticeships should receive a wage subsidy from the state of £5,000 a year to make their status more equivalent to the university students. And that family policy should be redrawn to make sure that people whose wives don't want to work, overwhelmingly the somewheres, while their children are small, should be able to get good tax breaks from the state in order to make that more affordable. So I'm really interested in how you think all of that might happen in an age of austerity, and would it be contentious? And can we afford any of the things which we want to do at a time when we're going to restrict immigration and probably also be poorer as a result? Fair enough. Thank, Thank you. you. Very good. Um, Tim, do you want to go yeah. next? Sure. He has a choice. <laughs> Does he have a choice? <laughs> um, I think my microphone just fell off, but I think it might be working. That's great. Um, echoing um, what's been said already, I found it a fascinating um, book, and uh, the distinction at the heart of it between somewheres and anywheres that uh, we've already touched on. Um, you can look at its flaws as a concept, and it, and it has flaws. But um, I was recently talking to Jenny about this um, the other day. I was with a BBC producer who was complaining about the fact that because of the uh, decay of labour, 
it was now hard for, harder for them to decide who they put up against a Tory spokesperson and said it's just not easy now to sort of balance a right-wing person with a left-wing person. And I think that's very good if it's going to force the BBC and other people to think a little bit harder about what balance and covering the national debate looks like because right versus left is also an incredibly flawed way of understanding um, the public discourse. And introducing something like somewhere versus anywhere, um, as flawed as it might be, um, is another way of localist versus centralist, uh, religious, non-religious, conservative, liberal, internationalist, nationalist. All these sorts of sometimes much more interesting debates than right versus left. Um, aren't covered partly because a lot of us in the media are lazy in how we formulate and how we think we achieve balance. And so the very act of this book in setting up a debate, I think, is incredibly important. And for me, um, what matters most is less how much I'm uh, somewhere or uh, anywhere uh, living between Salisbury and London. I think the fundamental thing for me is at the heart of the concept is the idea that actually your relationship to things matters. Your relationship to your nation, your relationship to your community, your relationship to your family and community. And where I think the book and this debate is incredibly spot on is for all the differences between the conservatism and the laborism that we've had ruling the country for the last few decades. It's essentially we've had materialist individualist ethos at the heart of them. One essentially is how we as an individual relates to the welfare state, um, how we, uh, you know, immigrants uh, with freedom of movement. Others is uh, about businesses having no loyalty to local communities. We're seen as taxpayers, employees, uh, welfare claimants. You know, we are individuals rather than neighbors, citizens, etc. all the relational dimensions that I think uh, church go as philanthropists. Those things haven't mattered in public debate. And this book to me, uh, the Brexit debate, is a call actually for identity and other things to start mattering um, to, to a large extent um, again. And I think part of the reason why we're in this pickle is that, and it's difficult to measure some of these things, but it is what we measure as a society. You know, it's GDP and a whole range of other things that are a heart of the national debate. And so therefore, politicians get judged on them. And so things like uh, an article I wrote for Rob Colville's CapEx recently, it means that you end up in a position whereby um, the, housing, the immigration's impact on the housing crisis, we know what immigrants contribute to society. What we don't know, because we not, didn't even try to measure it, is what's the impact of all of that on the disruption of the extended family and the care that the extended family you know, provides. Um, my mum and dad have just moved to Weybridge to look after my sister's new nephew, providing a level of childcare and love and a whole range of support that's enormous. So that doesn't appear in any national statistics. And we actually have the thing that should have been reversed by Philip Hammond today, in my view, was the childcare policy, which is pouring billions of pounds into a system which only rewards you if you pay for other people to look after your children rather than relatives. It's the sort of crazy uh, economics. And of course this works on a, uh, a, a global scale. It's the heart of the Brexit debate as well. Because we don't think about relationships, because we don't have any sense of the importance of n national nationhood or solidarity, you know, we end up being part of a continent and a system that cannot work. I was brought up in Germany. I saw what the West German people were willing to do for the East German people when unification happened. It was enormous, hugely sacrificial. And I, I'm beginning to fear something that English and Scots aren't willing, perhaps, to do for each other. But there's no way those same generous West Germans will begin to do the same for Greece, what is necessary to keep the, the union together. And I think the lack of relational thinking from that micro level of family to uh, supranational thinking on issues like uh, the EU. The absence of that is what is creating so much of the flawed um, politics um, that we have. And back to that BBC debate, you know, the idea of balance is having 
an Orange Book Cleggite, a Tory Cameroon, and a Labour Blairite on, where you're covering about the global villages that David talks about in his book. You're not getting to the, to the heart of um, the discussion. I think it's particularly brave. Jenny talked about David's uh, braveness. Um, the family section is, I think, incredibly important in this book. Um, uh, the family is the place where most welfare is done, most education is done. The Federal Reserve in the US have said that the breakdown of the family is the leading explanation for the rise in inequality that they're seeing in that. That's the Federal Reserve, um, not some sort of family or religious, religious group. And of course it's difficult to confront um, the issue of the family, but it's our failure to, to do so that I think explains a lot of the social problems um, that, that we have. Um, it's not easy, these areas, but just to sort of to sum up, um, two, three weeks ago, um, I think we lost one of the greatest uh, philosophers, thinkers of our time. I, I call him um, the Adam Smith of our, of our generation. I'm mentioning again uh, Capex. I wrote a piece on Michael Novak, the Catholic theologian who died. And we live, I think, in a time when um, you know, if you grow up on the right, you're a defender of the market. You're on the left, you're a defender of the state. Um, academics are increasingly in silos. We're increasingly specialist. Um, and you, know, you read an economics book today, and I don't think Adam Smith would recognize you know, what, it, what it was. You know, Michael Novak was a moral philosopher as well as, a, as an economist. And he understood the social context in in which he was recommending and understood the invisible hand to operate. And Michael Novak's very simple um, idea at the heart of his book was that, yes, you had a market, but it was just as important to have a strong state and a strong moral cultural sphere. That if churches and free press and neighborliness and families weren't strong, nothing could survive, just as courts and needed to be strong. You needed representative democratic institutions with good turnouts, not just you know, old people voting at the expense of young people. And of course, you recognize the market um, as well. And I think what is lacking, and I think it's worse because of the newspaper industry that some of us in this you know, uh, podium are part of, we're becoming the danger is as our circulations fall. National newspapers are less and less national. They're more and more sectional. And you see that in how we consume broadcasting, how ideas are generated. The, 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 the absence of people thinking nationally and not just appealing to narrow markets is, 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 a, is a real problem. And one of the great opportunities of Brexit is that we do rethink what it means to be British, what the British people get from, from, from British institutions. And um, I slightly agree with Morris Glassman's uh, critique on the Blue Labour, so, uh, the Prospect magazine, um, that whereas I, David's analysis is brilliant, the prescriptions at the end um, I don't think quite match uh, the scale of, of, of the challenge. And my certainly worry with Theresa May's government is for all that she seemed to get it in her speech on the steps of Downing Street, there's no beef. You know, it's a political repositioning but the universal credit is still taking 65% rather than 67% of income away from people. There's no real new house building, which I would say was, you know, was the main problem, and no real infrastructure spending of the kind that I think the North needs. So a great book, a great challenge, but uh, the policy agenda still to be uh, identified. Fair enough. Thank you. Um, last but not least. Um, congratulations to David. I think it's a very good book and um, very comprehensive, uh, nuanced um, uh, and uh, uh, sophisticated analysis. I, th I find it very persuasive and um, I know that there have been a number of books lately about the idea of the return to the nation state or the need for a nation state uh, framework um, through which to look at things. But I think this is uh, particularly helpful because it's anchored in the British experience and um, helpfully um, describes changes over the last 20 to 30 years, both in our economy but also our cultural uh, perspective, which I think um, bringing those two things together has, has been really valuable. And uh, I hope that lots of people will read it. And I've been recommending it, actually, to, to people that I know. And um, my fear, though, is that people won't read it because there is such an orthodoxy uh, in this country about 
the nation state, the idea of um, somewhere philosophy. And uh, even uh, friends of mine who voted leave uh, are very ambivalent about the idea that the nation state as an organizing unit, uh, the liberal democracy um, 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 th uh, for which it is a vehicle, um, is an important uh, 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 way of understanding society. And uh, I fear that there's a kind of uh, consensus that exists, which makes it really difficult for David's argument to break through. And it might be that this is the beginning of a debate. I hope it is. Um, I, I, I am partly, um, uh, in a very, very small way, partly to blame for that consensus. I know that 10 years ago, when David wrote his article, I agreed with him um, on the critique of multiculturalism. But I think I was, um, and we've had this conversation before, but I think I was more ambivalent about the idea of the nation state then. And I've been on a journey. Mm, We've all been on a journey, <laughs> um, and I'm, you know, I'm uh, much more willing to defend it um, uh, uh, against um, sustained attacks, um, certainly on, the, on a cultural level. Against London separatism. And London separatism, which um, I, I worked for London government for eight years, and uh, was always the most hostile to this idea that London should float off and become a city state, um, which is uh, both practically, you know, a nonsense, but also um, on a political level, um, I think would be outrageous. Um, we perhaps can discuss that later. Um, there are three things that um, I think David gets very right in this book. Um, the first, which other people have mentioned, is this categorization of anywheres versus somewheres, um, or not necessarily versus, but anywheres, somewheres, as a, as a way of uh, understanding um, our social experience. Uh, of course, as individuals, and you make this point, David, um, some of us are in the middle. Some of us are both anywhere and somewhere at the same time. So um, it doesn't really um, help to say, well, hang on, I think I'm both. You know, that's already accounted for in the book. And um, generally, when we look at, you know, as you know, sociologists, we don't look at things just from our personal subjective experience. We try and understand these categories and their relevance across the whole of society. And I do think it, uh, that categorization works really well. I think it's much better. Uh, than the simple divisions of left and right, as Tim says. Um, that's become increasingly outdated uh, for a lot of people. It's also much more uh, helpful uh, way of looking at things than ethnicity, uh, uh, which um, a lot of organizations still, um, you know, the Runnymede uh, Trust, for instance, still looks at things through the prism of ethnicity. Um, and I think that's increasingly um, uh, an exhausted category. I don't think that makes sense for a lot of people. Um, and I, there are lots of statistics in the book uh, which establish the reality uh, of these two categories, which I think is, is convincing. The second thing I, th I think um, David does very well in the book is talk in a nuanced and sophisticated way about the impact of immigration in Britain and uh, gets away from this idea that it's simply about economics or it's simply about culture, but brings together many, many different dimensions. And I thought what was particularly good um, was the way in which um, you taught David about the hollowing out of the economy and the jobs uh, and the aspirations for the low and the middle income groups and how that connects to the push for more people to go to university and the collapse of vocational education. When I was at City Hall, I, in, the, in the latter part of my time there, I looked after the brief for further education and vocational education. And it was clear that universities had been very, very well funded, very, um, uh, uh, you know, been success successful in lobbying government. And FE had basically been nowhere. FE had been ignored for a very long time. And um, the whole sort of skills and vocational skills conversation, politicians make speeches about it every year or two, and then nothing happens. Tony Blair, actually, in his memoirs once said, if you want to declare war on another country, the best time to do it is in a speech about skills, <laughs> because nobody will be paying attention to you. Uh, and I think that that is very um, true, that essentially a policy which um, really serves the vast majority of people in this country has essentially been neglected for decades because it didn't quite fit the, um, uh, the anywhere um, outlook, which is that everyone must go to university, everyone must uh, see universities as a, a vehicle of social mobility um, rather than you know, a place to educate people. Um, and uh, that's been um, a, a, a huge disservice to a lot of people. And it's um, uh, alongside immigration, uh, essentially businesses have found it much easier to hire people uh, from abroad than to train people here uh, to invest in apprenticeships uh, and to, uh, to try and you know, reproduce its own labor force. And there are you know, lots of um, uh, things we could say about the, um, 
the e economic arguments in this book, but I think fundamentally it's true that um, you know, part of the success of London, its economic growth, has been about the growth of its population. Essentially, it's a kind of extensive rather than intensive growth, which um, has created all sorts of other side effects and, and consequences. Uh, and I, uh, the, there's a very good section in the book actually about London, which I think is, I have to say this because I work for London government, is very pessimistic and probably unduly pessimistic, but it's a useful counterbalance to all the boosterism that people like me have been doing for the last eight years. It is important to remember that um, London is a wonderful cosmopolitan place, but for lots of people, particularly new migrants, it also feels quite hellish. Um, and it's very congested. There is a real problem with housing. And um, I think for a, a long time, there has been a, a kind of um, uh, implicit denial about the impact of its population growth on many of these other factors. And I know from experience talking to um, data analysts that uh, whenever they would talk about the reasons for population growth, it would always be, well, women are having more babies, uh, as if that was the explanation, which women? Who in particular? And it is actually that immigrant groups in London are having more children than, um, um, uh, uh, than non-immigrant groups. Uh, but you would never really hear that said. You would never really hear that explained. Uh, and, uh, and I think that that has become now a, a quite a common thing, that, that we don't really talk honestly um, about the impact. And then the third thing that I think David does very well is talk about how the dominance of anywhere thinking uh, has um, uh, uh, essentially uh, crowded out the somewhere thinking. Uh, and it's true, I'm sure, that there are many anywhere people who live in Stoke Newington who feel a very strong sense of community. But the reality is that the policies that have been enacted have not been mindful uh, of that way of living and have, have uh, I think, have, have very much been uh, uh, shaped by this kind of global village outlook. And, you know, you make the point that Gus O'Donnell had said, I think our responsibility as a country is to help uh, uh, immigrants from everywhere, not, not just people in this country, which is such a telling, uh, a, a telling uh, a a phrase. Yeah, he said his job yeah. was to maximise global welfare as exactly. head of the yeah. National Civil Service. Yeah. Um, and, you know, th th there has to be a contradiction there. There has to be uh, a tension that's worth um, uh, uh, bringing out. Uh, and, and I think the fact that he said it so honestly and so brazenly without really realising that there might be an issue there, um, I think is telling. Anyway, but still, <laughs> he said it to you, which <laughs> you must have known that it would come out. Um, <laughs> Um, the, the, uh, and and uh, when I was working in, in London government, I also um, had responsibility for the, um, the cultural brief. And I can tell you for a fact, you don't really talk about the art sector in this book, but there is literally no debate in the art sector about any of these issues. If you, if you even talk about the nation state, you are persona non grata. You are a nobody. You are a xenophobe. You should, you know, you're shut out. Uh, uh, you know, if you, if you argue that, you know, actually maybe we need borders, um, you know, maybe we should have uh, some controls on immigration. And you are literally, you know, your career is over, um, in my view. So I think, you know, th there are certain aspects of our cultural life where these discussions mm. simply do not happen. Mm. Uh, and I'm sure that the, you know, the Daily Mail and other parts of the press uh, uh, will push one way, but you know, there are other parts of the press, um, um, including BBC, that will push the other. Um, the w one thing that I would quibble with, and I don't think it's a criticism of the book, but it's um, something that I have noticed, which is the characterization of anywheres, sorry, of somewheres, is that they're left behind, that they find it very difficult to cope with change, that somehow there's a sort of deficit, um, that they can't cope um, um, with all this change that's going on. And um, somehow they're weaker than the anywheres who have this kind of resilient, confident, you know, globalist vision. I actually think that the, it may be the other way around. Um, that the somewheres, because of their rootedness, because of their uh, uh, sense of a community, are actually much more able to cope with change, much more resilient than we give them credit for. And actually, it's the anywheres, the people who have become disconnected and deracinated, um, who find that change is very upsetting uh, and, um, and actually are unable to cope. And, and the, 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 the piece of work that I did for Policy Exchange about 10 years ago about British Muslims um, tried to make this point that actually the Muslim community has not been successful at socialising the younger generation. And because that younger generation does not un feel connected to a wider national identity, they really are at sea. For a lot of young Muslim males in particular, uh, they have a very uncertain uh, view of their own identity, and that can lead to all sorts of 
problems. Uh, I also think that you know the the discussions around mental health with young people. Uh, you know, I'm I would argue that some of that is um, uh, overblown um, and um, uh, uh, inaccurate. But I do think there is a general problem that a lot of young people do not connect to um, the a sense of national identity and that that um, can be very disorientating for them. And so I would argue that actually there's a positive to celebrate uh, in, in being able to feel positive and, and feel a sense of solidarity um, uh, uh, in your nation. And um, you know the Danny Boyle ceremony was so uh, so often commented upon because it was a unique moment where we actually felt good about being British on the world stage. And I think people um, enjoyed that and, and, and would like to experience that more often. Um, I could say more, but I will stop yeah. there. Well, thank you very, very much. Um, well, um, you've given me a slightly easier time than I expected. Um, but let me just let me very quickly um, re reply to a, a, some of the points that have been raised. Um, and, and then we can open it up, open it up um, for, for public discussion. By the way, there are copies of my book, I forgot to say at the beginning. It, it, it does exist, and it is, uh, it is at the back there. Um, and uh, you can buy it if you wish. Um, uh, um, I, I think what one kind of big point that I didn't really say at the beginning, no one has particularly picked up on, I think one of the, one of the factors that is a sort of running theme in the book is the extent to which we have not acknowledged the way in which status, public status, has become so much more narrowly focused on educational achievement. Indeed, one might say cognitive ability over the last generation or two. Uh, you know, it wasn't that long ago when there were kind of other qualities that, 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 that were in play when you, were, when you were judging someone's value publicly, as it were, you know, sort of character experience. And of course, those things still matter to some extent, but the way in which we become so narrowly focused on certain forms of achievement, um, and that, ob that obviously then, you know, only by definition, only a subset of the population can flourish in. You know, half of the population are always in the bottom half of the, of the cognitive ability spectrum. Um, and, and at the same time that that has happened, uh, there has been a weakening of national social contracts for people in the bottom half, not so much of the cognitive ability spectrum, but of the income spectrum, as businesses have become more footloose, you know, the, the kind of assumption, you know, in the, the companies would just sort of as a matter of course, you know, train local people and so on. That all disappeared in the, in, in, as part of the Thatcher-Reagan revolution, and a lot of that was perfectly healthy and, and productive and created much more dynamic and, and efficient industries, but it broke something too in many parts of the country. Uh, and it came to be highlighted, I think, by freedom of movement. I mean, the, the sheer scale of freedom of movement and the fact that, I mean, it was real in-your-face globalization. You know, it's one thing your factory closes and transfers to China. But then when a whole kind of new workforce comes into your own country to compete with you and possibly live next door to you as well, that was a, a very serious trauma, I think, for all the people uh, well, that was not recognized. Um, to very quickly on the... Um, I mean, uh, you guys have been, generally speaking, um, uh, sympathetic. I mean, you've, got, you've been sympathetic too, but have made some sharper points. I mean, John, Jonathan's point about any... I mean, I, I, I don't agree with you. I mean, there's a somewhere... You're right that, that two of the, the, the two biggest selling daily newspapers, The Sun and The Daily Mail, have a kind of somewhere-ish view of the world. Um, it, it's, it's very loud and noisy, but it's oddly ineffective. I mean, you, you know, I mean, I, if you, I've gone through the list of policies of the last 15 years. It is very difficult to find somewhere preference policies outside of the fact that our prisons are so full. <laughs> Not a terribly attractive one, perhaps, but, uh, you know, the, yeah, it has dominated the criminal justice system. The welfare cap you can possibly attribute uh, to, um, to, to somewhere preferences. Um, the, the fact that we talk so much about immigration, possibly too, um, but we have done nothing about it, at least until Brexit. Um, we have done, you know, the numbers have continued to rise and rise and rise. We've had a, we've had a, we've almost talked about it too much, um, but because people have been aware of the of the anxieties and the hostility that a lot of people feel about large scale uh, immigration, but we've done nothing about it. So, I mean, and also I think your point your point is partly taken about. Um, uh, that the, the kind of anywhere slide too much into global villages. But I, 
But I mean, I, I am just looking at, at the statistics for a lot of this, and the statistics tell us that about 20, 25, 30 percent of the population are the people who feel comfortable in the modern world. I mean, extraordinarily high numbers of our fellow citizens do not feel comfortable in the modern world. I mean, there's this, this, um, uh, this opinion survey point about, you know, Britain has changed a lot in, in recent times. Uh, some people say it's, it feels like a foreign country. 62% uh, of the population agree with this. I mean, it's extraordinary. Uh, only 30%, you know, it's a slightly broader group than the anywheres don't. And I think anywheres have just taken you know, this broader group of anywheres. I mean, you know, they're, of course, they're normal people. They're, they're relatively rooted. They, they can be patriotic. Um, they're, they're not global villagers, but they have kind of taken for granted a broader set of anywhere uh, assumptions. Um, um, and um, Jenny's point about, um, I mean, I think the side at Varsi point is sort of partly sui generis, uh, but I mean, I mean, there clearly is, I mean, the, the, the Muslim population is the least well integrated of the large British minorities, um, uh, lives more separately, has, has values that, that distinguish it more from the, the kind of liberal British mainstream, uh, and that, that does create problems. I mean, there are, there are positive signs. Um, younger Muslim women, for example, are beginning to you know, identify more with um, with more with gender equality ideas and so on that they uh, that their, their their parents certainly don't identify with. So you can sort of see a gradual movement towards more mainstream norms. I think that's inevitable. Uh, I don't think it's inevitable, and and there are all sorts of other sort of other processes at work, uh, and it's a lot certainly a lot slower than any other of the large um, minority groups. Um, the, the point about it being expensive, I mean, yeah, <laughs> uh, some, of, some of it is expensive. I mean, I think that, I mean, I, 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 I agree with both you and Tim. I mean, I think my, my kind of, my new settlement chapter is probably the weakest in the book. Um, I mean, there are, there are I mean, I've been looking for, and, you know, and, and perhaps people here can come up with, I've been looking for kind of bridges, you know, bridges between anywheres and somewheres. One bridge, I think, is the environment. The, the you know, somewheres are on the whole against green policies because they don't see that it benefits them, it just puts up their energy bills. However, you know, somewheres are, you know, have a connection to place that is a kind of expression of, of green environmentalism. I mean, proper environmentalism is, is a sort of conservative movement in a way. It is about conserving things. Uh, I mean, it has, it's sort of become connected to sort of liberal leftism and, and state intervention and so on. But um, I think there, there, somewhere in there, there is a bridge. You might say the same thing about localism. Um, you know, somewhere is a very local rooted, um, you know, and we, uh, against the sort of, against the big voices, against the big projects, about little, little projects that, um, that, that um, infrastructure or whatever that, that then make, a, uh, make a difference. Um, and on, on, on cost, well, I mean, we have been through this, I mean, I mean the, the, the two proposals I make to try and, I mean, family life is not going to be made more stable. Um, we're not going to prevent uh, families breaking up, um, parents of children breaking up by giving them a few extra quid. That, that is true, but equally, there are an enorm enormous financial pressures on families, which if they were relieved a bit, would, clearly would help. Um, and build houses, build houses, build houses. If well, they were looking for the yeah. sort of alternative to Blair's education. education. Well, but, well, certainly in London and the South East. I think outside London and the South East, housing is not such an issue there. But, but the, we are, we've been gone through this incredibly expensive and, and in some ways regressive process of raising tax allowances it's now on what, 11,500 is it? It's going up to 12,500. Every time you go up a thousand like that, it costs billions. Now, why do you not, why does a government not say that the next round will only apply to those people who have children? Those people who are children under the age of 16 or something. Um, those people who are either married or cohabiting. I don't, I mean, marriage is clearly better than cohabitation, but I don't think this should be uh, uh, only reserved to people who are married. Um, th that you know, that would be a way of targeting it. It would be a way of helping families because we got rid of, or every other country in the world pretty well has has tax advantages for families with with children. We do not. 
we introduced tax credits partly to compensate for that lack. Um, but I think I think we, we could do that. As Tim said, you can only you can only have uh, you have to give your child to a stranger in order to qualify for some of this eight billion childcare money. Why do we not have some sort of you know care allowance for, for mothers that actually want to stay at home? So I think there are things that we could do without breaking the bank. Um, anyway, um, that, that's enough from me. Well, let, let's let's open it up um, and um, we've got how long have we got? Twenty minutes or so? Yeah. Um, um, uh, Kishwa, do you want to go first? Um, oh, of course, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Just say who you are, by the way. I'm Kishwa Faulkner, and I'm a member of the House of Lords, and I suppose I'm a paid up anywhere in the sense that I'm a migrant, a Muslim, married to a European, and I'm the only British passport holder in my household, at least was till last year. My daughter woke up and realized she needed to be a Brit. Uh. Uh, so uh, I, think, uh, uh, I think there are a couple of things I'd just like to pick up. One little flippant comment, uh, I hope you won't mind, Jonathan, but maybe if it was Christmas carols rather than Halloween that was taking place in Stoke Newington, mm. then you might find that there was less divergence across the country. Halloween is foreign. Uh, but I think my biggest <laughs> point my biggest point would be about say the Warsi and the enemy within, which is a book. Which is that and I say this, I'm sorry, passionately, that my generation of Muslim women and our mothers have killed ourselves for emancipation. The only reason that I arrived in this country forty thirty one no, forty years ago was because it was a free Western country where I didn't have to be bossed around by men telling me what to do and how to practice my religion. And the degree of parallel lives that is now accepted by the British establishment undermines us but infuriates us. And we look around our country now and think that you're just on that side. You're with the mullahs. You're with the shaggy bearded guys rather than us who really believe in buying into this country. And the final thing I would say about, I mean, here is an example. Today at PMQs, you had toading Tories standing up and slugging off the CJEU judgment yesterday on the hijab and the niqab, which if you read the judgment is extremely moderate, extremely. It's down to private companies as long as they don't discriminate between religions or religious symbols or philosophical symbols. I mean, how fair is that? And toading Tories were trying to get up and asked Theresa May whether she agreed that this was a terrible judgment because we have the best Muslims. I mean, the competition is now to have who, who are the best Muslims. Britain has the best Muslims. All the others are, you know, the ones who are freer, in other words, from my book, the ones who are freer are the bad ones. Um, but can I just come to one last right. point, which is the economics of it? And I don't know because I haven't read the book, but I wonder if you address the cleavage which is caused by the universality of payments. Because ultimately, whether it's perception or reality, I'm, I don't know if Jonathan Porter's is here, he'll probably attack me if he is. But, um, it's all right, we're a Porter's free zone. We're a Porter's free zone, that's <laughs> great. But, but ultimately, it is, and we disagree about this, but unless we have differentiation in contributing to avail of a service and not contributing, you are going to continue to have the cleavage, and I think that's where the real cleavage lies, it lies in economics, between the somewheres and the any anywheres. Until we have that, we're not going to address mm. this. Thank you. Um, right, l l let's, um, if people can try and, that was very, very stimulating, but slightly shorter from other people, please. Um, uh, Robert, just there. Quick, uh, with the white shirt, sorry, white shirt man. Uh, Robert Jackson, uh, former MP. I think, David, I haven't actually read the book yet, but I've just bought a copy. Right, um, I think the introduction of this new category of somewheres and anywheres is a really valuable addition to the political vocabulary. Um, I think it's important to realize that there are left-wing and right-wing anywheres. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the tone of the discussion has been rather that they tend to be on the left. R a t typical right-wing anywhere policy is radical free trade, as in when we go out of Brexit, um, we uh, adopt, I think it's called the Singapore model. Uh, now, I think that this question of free trade, and that's the basic idea behind globalization, 
And the globalization, as you point out, is one of the things that's actually driven this cleavage. Um, that is, I think, a really urgent political issue which is coming up. Uh, are we going to accept what I think is basically an anywhere point of view that, for example, leaving on WTO terms is cliff edge? Mm. Uh, maybe a dose of protectionism is actually what we need to get a bit back, of, a bit of Th social stability back. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Uh, Mark at the back, the local lad. I've lambasted you on this point while we've been making coffee, but now I'd like to do it in a more public uh, setting. <laughs> hurry up. I think it's outrageous that you characterize uh, the anywheres as being liberal. I mean, they're the least liberal people you can imagine. They see politics through the prism of identity politics. They're not universal, universalist individualists at all. And part of the, the reason they're so snowflakey now about free speech is precisely because they are obsessed about not offending uh, various uh, of the identity categories they have created. Well, that might be true, theory. Mark, but you're talking about a sub subset of anywhere. No, I mean, no, no, I, I, mean, they're, they're, they're I, mean, I talk about anywhere as 25% of the population. I think they're very significant, but growing minority. And Wait, lastly... Can I know who you are, because I don't... Well, sorry, my name's Mark Glendenning. I work with... Um, you Dave. work with him. He, he, he yeah, works yeah. here at Policy Exchange. Thank yeah. you. Um, and, and the last point is they don't accept referendum and general election results when they go against their way. So they're now <laughs> organizing marches against democratically elected uh, leaders. Uh, you know. So yeah. the point is these people are the real threats to liberal democratic values, not the somewheres. Well, fair enough. Um, uh, gentlemen there, um, well, David Landsman and then the guy to his right. Yeah. David Landsman. Um, not, Sorry, yeah, David, yeah, yeah. David Lanson. I used to be a British diplomat. Now I work for Tata, which does a number of things, most of them with high tech, so they're all very clever people. Uh, and that's actually my point. Um, rather like you know, Donald Trump fo focuses on globalization as the enemy of the American worker, whereas you could argue it's automation. Um, it strikes me automation is the, an elephant in the room here. It's going to cut a swathe through a lot of the respectable somewhere middle classes uh, and take them out of work. What are we going to do about it? Um, somewhere down the line, we have to reassess, as a result of greater automation, uh, what jobs are valued. Uh, care workers, for example, uh, are not much valued, but actually they bring something which is human. Uh, once the machines take over a lot of what we think of at the moment as being valued, like I suspect 9 out of 10 accountants and 5 out of 10 lawyers can be made redundant by, um, by IT, it'll be the human jobs uh, that we have to start valuing. Uh, and if we're looking for solutions, and that's not a solution, it's not a policy solution with a budget attached to it, but it's just a thought. Thank you. Uh, uh, John Holbrook, I'm a barrister and I also write for Spiked. Uh, I wondered, David, if you could say anything about the why and the how of this issue. Because surely if 25% of the population have come to dominate public policy in the way that I agree with you, I think they have, that requires some explanation. And uh, I, I just wonder if it, it, what we need to look for is some sort of political set of ideas that binds the anywheres together, some set of coherent ideology, even though I appreciate they probably don't want to articulate it and they don't. W what I'm wondering is to what extent your couplet could also be, with a little bit of development, equate to that of the elite versus everyone else. Uh, and I know some people don't like this. Whenever you use the word elite, many people guffaw immediately. But it, it, there is a political idea behind that notion, namely that the elite are people who do rather look down their noses at people. They don't like democracy. They love the law because the law means that decisions are made by lawyers and not by ordinary people. Um, and, and it just seems to me that, th th that there is a sense in which a lot of people who you might describe as anywheres, if you really press them, they do have a dislike and distrust for ordinary people. Well, I, I think it's a good point you make about, um, about sort of technocracy. Technocrats are inevitably people with anywhere preferences and intuitions. So the more things are taken out of the kind of normal political conflict and put into independent central banks or... Or, you know, or, or core, indeed courts, I mean the expansion of you know, judicial activism and so on, it is all taking even more power away from some ways and giving it to any ways. But, um, John Denham. David, thank you. John Denham uh, used to be an MP. Just to follow on Kishwin and Robert's point, I think one of the most dangerous combinations is when the left-wing anywheres get on the same side of a debate as the right-wing anywheres. And that particularly applies to the history of the welfare state 
which was set up as a contributory welfare state. In the 1960s, the left wing anywheres began an assault on it with some very reasonable arguments that a contributory system was very male orientated and all the rest of it, and that things should be based on need. Once they begun to win the argument that it should be based on need, not contribution, the right wing anywhere said, so it's a matter of cost, and how much can we reduce the cost by focusing on need through means testing? And to go back to Jonathan's point, he'll find that his somewhere press were actually the cheerleaders on cutting the welfare budget and ever more excluding more people from it. So you end up, as Kishman said, to a, to a situation in the welfare state where people feel there's no value for contribution and belonging. So it's not, I think, a single anywhere working together. It's two bits of the anywhere community using your argument coming together to produce a very unpleasant outcome for the majority. Mm. I mean, just to tell you what, briefly on that, interesting, talking to someone like David Willits about the reasons for the destruction of the apprenticeship system in, in the 1980s. I mean, it was partly because it, it was being destroyed by economics. All the factories were closing. But there was a conscious attempt, there, there was a view that the apprenticeship, apprenticeship system was based on a kind of privileged, upper working class, white male culture that, that, that conservatives wanted to destroy at that time. You know, they were the kind of print workers and the miners and the, uh, the people who were sort of seen as the enemy. Now, uh, there may have been perfectly good reasons for that, but in the process, they destroyed something else, too. They destroyed other things. And you see that in other areas, like, uh, like public housing. You know, that the, the working class people had a sort of patrimony. They had a kind of, it was part of, the, they regarded as part of their sort of social inheritance. And then, when, partly, but, partly, but not only because of immigration, you, you started having council housing dependent not so much on sort of who you knew and connections, but on, on need. And, and obviously, you, you could argue with that at one level. On the other hand, it led to, you know, it had unintended consequences that, um, that the woman in red there. Um, Caroline Jackson, uh, wife of Robert Jackson, who looks very, very worried about what I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Should a somewhere, yeah. I think. Um, in the sense that I come from Penzance. Mm. And I'm also um, uh, an, an anywhere in the sense that I worked as an MEP and a civil servant in Brussels. It does seem to me that the message I get from all this is that you all need to really to get out more. Um, and in particular, I think of my own West Country, which voted strongly against uh, the membership, British membership of the EU. And I think that we should really go on from what you're saying in this book, David, and ask why it is that the somewheres who predominate in places like the West Country, I don't know what happens in Stoke Newington, but in the West Country, a Muslim is what you put up in the curtain. Mm. <laughs> um, uh, we, 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 need to, we need to know what is going to motivate the somewheres to, to be more actively engaged in British membership of the EU if it happens to Thank you. continue. Right. Let's have somebody un un under 40, probably. Harry yeah? Scoffin, fellow. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Uh, we'll, we'll come to you, and then, and then we then we then. Do we need to wind up? What time are we? Hi there, it's Harry Scoffin, York York Union so fellow. York oh, right, yeah, and good. you came and spoke Welcome. at that yeah, fantastic yeah. event on multiculturalism. Right. About that, very quickly. The good thing about Brexit is that hopefully it will mean a whole reevaluation of various policy areas that for too long politicians have refused to talk about. Namely, one is multiculturalism. Immigration, you said yourself, people have got obsessed with it. Now, the hang-wringing hang liberals have refused to talk about multiculturalism for so many years. Trevor Phillips was fantastic at that debate as well. Where would you see a good, sensible compromise between the anywheres and the somewheres on something like multiculturalism? Mm. Uh, just one or two more, um, Mary. Mary, and then uh, is it Robert? Yeah. Oh, I'm Mary Dushevsky. I write for The Independent and The Guardian, so I'm uh, a fish a little bit out of water. Um, <laughs> I've got two points. One of them is that I really, really want to press the point about family taxation as opposed to individual taxation, um, partly because I agree with it um, and have run into all sorts of trouble for saying this. But at the moment, we have a system which 
one of the reasons why families on relatively low incomes with children are impoverished in this country where they're not in the United States and in most of continental Europe is because there is a household-based taxation system. And you run into problems with women's lobby about this but because they they'd say, oh, it means that the, the, the men are going to um, sign the, 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 the household um, taxation form. But that's not how it needs to be. Um, and I think it's very important that we return to that. Um, the second thing is just a footnote on the Danny Boyle um, Olympic. Um, I asked the BBC, um, the first Christmas after 2012, I asked the BBC whether they had any plans, um, and if not, why not, to make that a, a, a sort of rerun of that um, part of Christmas on the BBC. Uh, because it seemed to me that it was this sort of yeah. unifying thing. Mm. And the answer was no, there were no, but there were no plans to rebroadcast it, to repeat it at all. And it seemed to be all to do with the marketing exercise for BBC CDs, and it wasn't clear where the copyright lay. Um, so th there's an interesting question there that I haven't followed up anymore, but it, it is a question. Well, that's, a, that's a brilliant idea. We should have it every, every year. The same Sorry procedure as every year. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Robert Colwell from CapEx. Quick, uh, quick question, and forgive me if you address this in the book, uh, but uh, what role do you see technology playing? Not so much um, automation, but the, the social uses of it. Because um, obviously there's a case that the, the things you're talking about, the way that um, our sort of connections with other, with other groups in society have been snipped away is, is enhanced by the sort of centrifugal effects of technology, that we can find our own tribes online and we don't have to bother about the, the people who live a few hundred miles down the road. Mm, yeah. Um, we should really go, go on then, Max. Max Wind Cowie. Come on. No, it's all right. It's all right. No, you don't need to shout. Max Wind Cowie from ResPublica. I mean, David, I agree with you very much about a lot of this stuff. I've been stupid enough to work for you over the years. Um, <laughs> but I wonder, though, a lot of this book and your work seems to be about trying to forge bridges between these two communities, but you're also talking about the way in which they are leading inexorably away from each other. And I guess it's a sort of hypothetical question, which is, would you rather live in an anywhere Britain or in a somewhere Britain, really? Because it seems to me that for all of the respecting of somewhere views, deep down, most of us would rather live in an anywhere country. That's a quick, quick, quick fi final. Oh, there's another York man. Come on, uh, qu quickly. David, thank you. Yes, other end of the uh, age spectrum. Who are you? Afraid. Nick Patrick Brown. I'm a London councillor. Um, with a lot of anywheres living in the, uh, in the borough I represent. But it seems to me that the point I wanted to ask was about uh, one policy initiative that was really focused on somewheres that was really quite significant or had the promise of being quite significant, and that was the big society. Uh, and it seemed to me that that was all about encouraging neighbourliness, voluntary effort, uh, the charity sector, quiet interventions, non-state interventions. And it actually got laughed out of court quite quickly mm. by the Liberal establishment. And I mm. just wonder whether that uh, has not mm. done too much for um, good community yeah. relations. Fair point. But very quick, la last two here. At the, fr uh, the gentleman at the front, um, and then Douglas. Yeah, my name is Jonathan Duke Evans. I'm a civil servant, though not particularly representing anyone. I was involved a few years ago in the introduction of the much derided British citizenship test. Oh, good but, um, well, your book clearly needs to be read, but I haven't read it yet. What worries me on the description you've given of it, particularly of the somewheres, is that it does seem rather reductive. I mean, it, it, it seems to me that at times you're describing a kind of community of medieval peasants, uh, perhaps having substituted allegiance to the local football team for atavistic Christianity, but otherwise totally untouched by the Enlightenment or by modernity. Now, is that, is, if that's not a correct characterization, then you know, how do you... Yeah, How I do you feel? I, I talk about semi somewheres as being um, uh, as being characterised by a, by what I call decent populism. Many people would think that's a contradiction in terms. What I say is that we've had a huge liberalisation on on is cultural issues, particularly in the last 30 years. But, sorry, could you, could you just say that how then you think they've been affected by modernity generally? I mean, how, how? Well, they are as modern as you or I. 
I mean, um, I mean, they're, they're modern people. They're suspicious of authority. They believe in equal rights for women and uh, minority rights. And, uh, but they, they don't believe in mass immigration. They do not believe in, I mean, they do believe in contributory welfare states. They don't, they, and they believe in rootedness. They believe in, in family values. They believe in, they believe in national attachments. Um, and, uh, and all sorts of things that, that, that anywhere don't actually believe, or not nearly so strongly. Um, Douglas. Um, Douglas Murray, um, I just wanted to pick up very quickly on, on a point that Jenny made about how to bridge the gap and what, what to do, as it were. And one thing that strikes me is that um, we're very good in the anywheres, are particularly good at talking about the language of inclusion. But a language inclusion necessitates a language of exclusion as well, which is one which almost nobody in our politics is willing to do. We are, after some decades, willing to say, for instance, that we would not want any more clitoridectomists in the UK. Um, but that's about it. <laughs> what are they? So we have to do no, right, right, right. a bit better, possibly. Right. And it might require some bravery from the somewheres <laughs> and the anywheres. Hmm. Um, well, that's great. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I just want to say hold on, hold on. Microphone. Okay, okay. It's very quick, it's going to be very quick. Is that? Everyone is from somewhere. I mean, we're all living in a nation state and we're all taxpayers. It doesn't seem to be any realistic sense of people being from anywhere. It seems a bit strange to me to even create that kind of, what do you call it, an opposition or dichotomy. You just, we just all come from somewhere. Everyone in here is a British citizen. I don't know where else, <coughs> what else I could say about it. Well, you can buy the book and you can find out exactly what I'm saying. Well, just, just right. to, Tim, just to respond to exactly that point, I was talking to a young person um, a month ago or so who was saying to me, I just don't understand why I have to pay any attention to all this Brexit nonsense. He said, I feel completely um, in touch with all the 20-somethings I know who live in Paris, Berlin, New York, Amsterdam, um, South America. I don't want anything to do with all these people who are sitting there in their little country villages saying, I don't want immigrants here. I don't see why I should have anything to do with them. I just want links across the nations to the people who are like me. He was the absolute embodiment of anyone else. They're a part of the system and they're, 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 they're judged yeah. by the same laws that everyone else in this but they don't feel allegiance. Like that's your global village. That's, global village. Have, that's David's global village. Exactly. All right. It's not okay. okay. Look, okay. I, I want you three guys to have, to have one minute each, but I want a, a very final word from another lady in red. Go on. <laughs> A very distinguished lady in red. Go on, uh, tell us who you my are. My name is Anne Leslie. Anne Leslie. And I have a problem with us sort of scratching away at this problem of identity. Because most people, I mean, my identity is very strange. I was born in India before it became Pakistan, which just tells you how old I am. <laughs> um, when I was made a dame, the English language <laughs> newspapers in, in uh, India called me an NRI, non-resident Indian. So, you know, that's because I was born there. Um, I, you know, worked in 70 countries. I, I, I sometimes think that one of our problems now, in a sort of post-imperial, that we're so self-conscious. Everything we do is, you know, is this politically correct, or is that snowflake, or is it... I'm not sure that too much self-consciousness actually helps us all feel more belonging or anything like that. I mean, I'm going to read your book. I read your last one. I thought it was terrific. Um, but I find that, you know, going around the world as I did when I was a foreign correspondent, people did worry about identity there, but it was often not this kind of psycho... Thing. It was, you know, <coughs> who's nicking my land mm. uh, and that sort it of thing. It may be a function of affluence that we got, we, you know, because we're not yes, worrying about where our next meal is coming from, we, we can, can start to worry lovely, about identity. Yeah. evening here yeah. with some red wine mm. and intelligent people and it is really, it shows we're a very, check our privilege is what yeah. I say. Yeah, all right, fair enough. <laughs> okay, very quickly, a, a minute from Jonathan to reply to any or none of the many interesting comments and questions that have been asked. Well, and then first thing I, and then okay, so let me keep an eye on the first thing I want to say is something of praise for your book, which I sort of glossed over because I thought we were taking as read that we were all here that we think it's wonderful. Um, <laughs> but I realise I undersold David. So one particularly important thing I think is what I would say is it, it's the way it views these problems non-economistically. 
mm. which me meaning that particularly on the Labour side, Ed Miliband, as much as Jeremy Corbyn, assumed that the problem with immigration is only about you know wages that are squeezed, mm. etc., and there could be an economic fix. And I've always thought, my intuition on this has always been that it is about culture and about identity and about people seeing the community they live in change. And the Labour response then and now has never matched mm. that. And I think it's mm. one, one of the real strengths of the book, it does that. And there is this absolute choice, Gus O'Donnell quote, and later on I'm going to find out whether it was on or off the record, um, because it's a great story, David. It's on the record now. It's on the record now. <laughs> <laughs> but perhaps it wasn't intended at the time. Um, but it's a, it's a proper little scoop, that one. So we should give him David credit for that. Um, this point about minorities, you, you sort of said that, uh, you know, I read those bits of the book closely. I think the point I'm making is that you, even if you give credit internally for the way these minority communities are, that they have a lot of somewhere values, Overall, you are framing the arrival of people who are different from the white majority as at least a challenge to the majority, to the somewheres. They, they are somehow, their position is unsettled and threatened by their arrival. And what I was just saying is... No, I and think that changes over time. Different. Yeah, initially. You said you're very yeah, yeah. keen to find bridges. I'm yeah. saying to you that I'm, I agree about environmental, but this is a really obvious bridge, that the very people that you're scared of, in a way, are like you. And that's actually a very positive thing. And their arrival mm. actually shores up some of these somewhere values. The last thing I was just going to say is something about this discussion. I worry, because David has done a very good and nuanced job with these categories. I worry in the course of the conversation we've just made anywhere people with views I don't like, and particularly people with sort of crudely liberal Guardian reading values, and it becomes just mm. another slogan. It's, it, that does a disservice to what you do in the book. It's more subtle than that. And it's very easy if we just frame it as everyone in this room is great, but they're these horrible anywheres who are just these sort of deracinated was a word that was used, and these footloose people. That's why I was trying to preempt that by saying David has a category for that, which is the global villagers who are the real sort of hardcore, like your friend who wants to only links with Barcelona rather than with Basingstoke. You know, they exist, but I think if you think that all anywheres are just these scary, horrible people who are just, then, then you'll be doing a disservice to the book and you won't get anywhere with healing this rift, which is how you look at it. By the way, I want to read that for a Privately. It starts British Jews. I don't know what yeah. else it says. <laughs> oh, the glasses are coming. Um, Good. No. Yeah, I just want to say this, is really, this, this really is a very fascinating book and you all need to read it. Um, I think that w one of the things that um, we have to, that has to be addressed about somewhere is, of course, what they're really seeking is what they've lost in the last 25 years, which is meaning, purpose, security and fairness. And a lot of the points that were raised now about um, family taxation and about the position of women and so on, um, go right to the heart of that. I remember reading a fabulous book by um, Jeff Dench, who worked with Michael Young, who did um, the great survey of the um, Brits in the, in the East End in the 50s, which was... Family and kinship. Family and kinship. Um, and Jeff Dench said that what happened with Labour policy in 1945 is they deliberately set out to destroy the family structures that forced women to look after the older members of their family and mothers to look after their children. They thought they were liberating women by introducing allowances that allowed women to live independently from men and meant that they didn't have to depend on their mothers for childcare and so on. Dench is really fascinating about how when you go back to the East End at the beginning of the 20th century, then you discover that actually, at end, end of the 20th century, you discover that it's full of young white women living totally isolated lives in their little one-bedroom flats, and all they long for is a husband with a wage. That actually the replacement of the husband by this payment from the state and the loss of their families um, has not compensated in any way at all. And my last one, I think Doug makes a really excellent point, which is skated over all the time, that all inclusion is based on excluding somebody. And when we talk, as Jonathan does, about actually the people who arrive are just like us, well, in, often in many ways they're not. And there's a very difficult question, which is whose values give way and what adaptations are made and what things of value are lost in the process. And it is not a game in which everybody wins. Something is lost and something is gained, and sometimes both sides gain something, and sometimes both sides lose something. You can't pretend that it isn't a tension. And that's one of the things that we really have to come to terms with instead of skating over the surface of our multicultural societies. Thank you very much, Annie. Final word. Uh, I think there are two mistakes that are made in this debate. Um, the first is that people think that um, our identities are so much more fluid now. We have technology, we're identifying with people from different countries, and, and those identities are um, the new identities that, that, that will form um, our way of being in the world. 
Um, of course, those identities are important. You know, I have them. We all have different layers of identity. But there is something specific about the national identity, which it's based in a certain materiality, a certain economic fact of life, which is that we are part of a unit um, that creates, that um, makes things together, that trades as one that has uh, a rule of law, uh, which has institutions like the BBC. Uh, it's as real as a hospital bed. It's as real as the NHS. You might not like the NHS. It may, you might, you might want to uh, change it. But there's a reality to national identity. And it hasn't gone away. It hasn't, it's not dead. But we are in denial about it. And that's why you've got this interesting debate here about, you know, but it's real. Hang on, we're all part of the nation, aren't we? And yet there are people who think it's not real. It is real, but we just don't want to admit it. And that makes it very difficult to have an intelligent, honest conversation about the nation state. Yeah. The second thing that I think um, people do mistakenly is that they assume that the somewheres, the white working class in places like the north of England, are <laughs> terrified and are hostile immediately to new people coming in. When my dad came to Oldham in the 1960s, uh, you know, he worked in the factories uh, and uh, actually had quite a lot of white working class friends. They were, you know, happy to welcome him and, uh, you know, they would, uh, uh, you know, be part of uh, the same friendship group. And it's not the case that there's a kind of inherent racism in the white working class, but there is a definite anxiety about the numbers, the speed and the impact that it's had in combination with all the other things that have happened in the economy, which David talks about in this book. And I think actually it's the intolerance of the anywheres um, that's been the real problem that, that you know, Mark talks about this, um, uh, the intolerant um, kind of snowflakiness of the anywheres. After the Brexit vote, the way in which some of the anywheres uh, reacted to the white working class, you know, they're thick, they're ignorant, they're not educated, they shouldn't be allowed to vote. That to me was the, the, the most, uh, 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 a uh, clear example of the breakdown of national solidarity. Solidarity beyond class, beyond region. The sense of, you know, we're all in it together. <coughs> Completely gone. Yeah, Tory, I mean, the left are much more politically intolerant. I mean, there's the famous T-shirt, isn't it? Never kissed a Tory. There isn't a, a right-wing equivalent to that. Never kissed a lefty. I've never seen a T-shirt saying it's never kissed a lefty. It's about the right. Right, yeah, right, <laughs> the right wings are more promiscuous, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, th thank you very much indeed. And, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, if, if it has stimulated your interest, there, there are a few copies left at the back to purchase, uh, which would be very nice. Um, I want to, again, thank Policy Exchange for, for allowing me to have this event and, and, and helping to contribute to, to me writing the book in the first place. And, uh, and I want to thank Dean Godson, who's there at the back in particular. So uh, thank you all for coming, and, let, and let's say thank you to everybody in here.